sentences. But look at verse 18, just for the sake of context. And do not be drunk with wine, for that, which means being drunk with wine, is debauchery, and be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, we come to a topic of vital importance in that it affects our relationships in the home, at church, and in our other places, especially in our jobs for those that are working. Yet it is a topic that generates a lot of friction and indeed a lot of heat because the biblical viewpoint is about a diametrically opposite uh, or opposed to that of the world as it could be. It is as far as it can possibly be. So that in the context of biblical Christianity, when you are talking submitting, it bears no resemblance to what the world refers to as submitting. And if you want to follow God and his word on this subject, you must consciously throw off the worldly mindset and decisively submit to what God's word plainly states. Our subject is submission. And first in a general statement and then applied specifically to marriage, the family, and the workplace. Ephesians 5.21 translated literally is submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. It is the last of the five participles that spell out the results of being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The first three is center on joyful worship, verse 19. Uh, and then the fourth is always giving thanks for all things, verse 20. Now the last relates to our relationship with each other, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. It also serves as a topic phrase to introduce Paul's uh, teaching on Christian marriage, as we will be looking in verses 22 all the way to verse 33. So if you want to know more about Christian marriage uh, next week and going down, those will be the issues that we will be dealing with. And besides that, it will be uh, also to deal with instruction to children and parents, chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, and then directions to slaves and masters. So all of these are summarized in submitting yourselves to one another. I will warn you, if you don't like what the Bible teaches, you can find purportedly Christian authors who try to explain the text in line with the world's thinking. And that is a problem because with a worldview uh, that is not centered on God and trying to bring a Christian uh, understanding of this word, you will indeed be struggling. Now, the world encourages everyone to stand up for their rights. The feminist movement promotes women's rights. The homosexual movement promotes so-called gay rights. And they are ruining a perfectly good word that used to be happy. And they are corrupting it. Some advocate children's rights to be free from parental authority. And then... Uh, this parental authority promotes, uh, goes, transcends into animal rights, often and above human rights. 
If you think that your rights have been violated, you can easily find a lawyer who will take your case to court. You may win a ridiculously huge settlement. So the world's way is assert yourself. Stand up for your rights. You don't have to take such treatment. They will encourage you. Get an attorney to fight for your right. God's way is submit to one another in the fear of Christ. These views are at polar opposites. But as I said, you can find those claiming to be Christians in most cases who try to bend the Bible to fit the world. But as God's people, we must submit ourselves to his word as our only authority so that we are not conformed to the evil world. I need to begin by explaining the different interpretations of our text. The first is unacceptable for the reasons that I've already mentioned. The other two are different to decide between them. The first view is the so-called evangelical feminism, which states that Ephesians 5.21 as an overarching controlling principle of mutual submission that abolishes any hierarchical distinctions based on gender in the church or at home. There are some who claim to be evangelical feminists. They would also appeal to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 where Paul states that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. These verses, uh, it is claimed to do away with any gender-based roles in marriage or even in church leadership. Now, books have been written to refute this. One of the best books I can suggest is Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood that is published by Crossway and it is edited by John Piper and Wayne Grudem. But in brief, it seems that the following verses, verse 22 to 24, decisively show that Paul was not abolishing gender-based roles. Also, there are many other verses that stipulate male leadership very categorically in languages you cannot be confused about. In the home and also in the church. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, chapter 14, verse 34, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, chapter 3, verse 1 to 10, and Titus indeed, chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. And lastly, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. In my judgment, the very fact that this feminist view did not emerge in church history until the feminist movement emerged in the world makes it suspect. It is a case of the church conforming to the world. And therefore, in my estimation, evangelical feminism is strictly feminism and there is nothing evangelical about it. Second view is that verse 21 does not refer to mutual submission of everyone in the church. Rather, it refers to wives submitting to husbands, children to parents, and slaves to masters, especially out of the following verses. Now, Peter O'Brien argues clearly for this. The letter to the Ephesians is the book that he wrote, and it is also endorsed by Piper and Grudem. Now, the main argument of this view is that the semantic meaning of the Greek word for submit also exclusively refers to someone subjecting himself or herself 
to another who is in authority over that person. It is used elsewhere in the New Testament to refer to Jesus' submission to his parents. Luke chapter 2 verse 51. Or demons being subject to the apostles. Luke chapter 10 and verse 17 and verse 20. And also of, sub, of citizens being subject to government, governing authorities. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Of the universe being subjected to Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Also of unseen powers being subject to Christ, of Christ being subject to God the Father, and of the church members being subject to their elders or wives being subject to their husbands. And therefore, in the second view, this word is clearly authoritarian in the sense of a structure, one above the other. But the main argument against this view is the term one another, which is used in that passage, which means, or which seems to refer to mutual submission. But those who hold this view counter that, that the term is not always used to refer to exclusively mutual relationships. For example, if you look at Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4, which says that men would slay one another. Obviously, it does not mean that every uh, one mutually kills everyone but rather that some would kill others. Or, as you would note in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, where that word of one another uh, is used, which commands us to bear one another's burdens, does not mean that we mutually exchange burdens, but to bear one another's burdens does not mean that uh, we... Uh, actually exchange, as I've already said. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33, for instance, where Paul tells the church to wait for one another before partaking of the Lord's Supper, in if it, it means that those who are ready early should, before partaking of the Lord's Supper, uh, wait for others. What used to happen, especially in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, is if you get to church early, uh, then you need to, and you are ready to partake, you go ahead and do so. Of course, here we have uh, decided that we will wait for one another so that when it comes for one, for us to take the cup, we do so together. For us to take the bread, we do so together. But so the essence here is when you talk of one another, uh, it can have different meanings in the sense of if people kill one another, it doesn't mean at the end of the day there is no one who is alive. Because the one who kills the other first cannot then, uh, will be the last man standing. Otherwise, that word one another has been dismissed, that phrase one another, by those who are saying uh, submission always implies rank. While this view is very compelling and may be correct, I am still inclined to the third view, which is that there is a sense of mutual submission in biblical relationships in which, listen to this, we lay aside our rights and humbly serve one another in love. This is a view of most commentators. It does not do away with the concept of hierarchy or authority in the various God-ordained spheres, as in this case of husbands with their wives, parents with their children, or servants with their masters. Jesus was authoritative over his disciples but he laid aside his rights and washed their feet. He taught them in Mark chapter 10, 
from verse 42 to verse 44, and I quote, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Now, that's a contrasting thing. In the world, those who are higher lord it over. But among you, it should not be the same way. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. That seems to be Jesus' uh, commentary on this uh, phrase. But so, while husbands do not throw away their authority over their wives, they should lay aside all selfishness and authoritarian dominance. Instead, they obey our text by laying down their lives for their wives as they selflessly seek their wives' highest good. Now that's interesting because that seems to be the meaning here implied in chapter 5, verses 25 to 29. But friends, we will get there in due course and God willing perhaps next week. But the issue here is we need to know that we are to serve one another selflessly without being selfish. I was chatting with my wife the other way and we were noting uh, that it would seem like younger men these days and just men in general who are married, they have a tendency of slave master kind of submission to the extent that uh, they are to be selfishly served as opposed to mutually serving uh, the other party. Now, John Calvin argues, when a husband lovingly bears the burden of his wife, is that not subjection? Is he not submitting himself? When a father lovingly gives himself for his children, this is subjection. When we assist one another, it is servitude or being servants or subjection. Therefore, there would seem to be a sense in which we all are mutually submitted to one another without at the same time abandoning our roles of God-given authority. That's in our text, then Paul is saying, filled with the Spirit, believers, relationship should be marked by joyful submission to one another out of the fear of Christ. Let me just discuss this around three subheadings. And number one, being filled with the Spirit is the foundation for proper submission to one another. When I do premarital counseling to unbelievers, I, I tend to spend quite a bit of time on this, that the world's understanding of submission is the hierarchical one. And therefore, we bring it as an import into marriage so that a well-submitted wife is one who kneels before their husband who does things that you and I would immediately say, wow, that's perhaps pushing the passage too far. Now, I'm basing this on the grammatical connection between verse 18 and verse 21. Let's look at it. Verse 21 is the result of verse 18. Being filled with the Holy Spirit means to be under the Spirit's Control. To the extent that you are not controlled by the Holy Spirit, you are controlling your own life. So every spirit filled Christian is a submissive Christian. 
you have submitted yourself, your life to the control of the Holy Spirit since God has ordained certain spheres of authority in which you are to submit. If you are submissive to the Holy Spirit, we will be submissive to these God-ordained authorities. This is, I think, easy if you understand it correctly. We are to be controlled, according to verse 18, by the Holy Spirit. And when you are controlled by the Holy Spirit, then in guiding you, the Holy Spirit leads you in being submitted in all God-ordained structures. Secondly, God has ordained authority and submission in various spheres to accomplish his purposes and also for our blessing and protection. We recognize this in any human endeavor that requires the involvement of many people. Like even our group here, we are a big group that needs some kind of hierarchy to guide. But the aim of the hierarchy, the aim of submission is not, uh, as First Peter tells us in chapter 5, uh, is not lording it over, but rather is to accomplish specific purposes and also for us who are involved in this whole enterprise, it is our blessing and also our protection. To build a house, someone has to be in charge in order to coordinate the project. I think many good houses have a building inspector and also one who is a supervisor who makes sure that things are done accordingly. The contractor, the one who actually does the work, is the one who follows a plan. Now, to follow a plan is to submit yourself to what has already been predetermined. You cannot have a plan in your hands and then go and do something else. For us to be submitted to the Holy Spirit and therefore to one another means we are doing so within a predetermined plan. And therefore, the one who builds, organizes, and brings in various subcontractors. For instance, to put up a structure like this, there needs to be one who does the brickwork. Sometimes then electrician comes in. Sometimes another uh, subcontractor comes in. And they do so at appropriate times uh, to move the project along. The workers have to submit to the directions of their boss who submits to the overall direction of the contractor. Therefore, if anyone moves from the plan and direction of the contractor, the progress of the house will be stalled or set back. I think also when we drive on the roads, we find that we, there are rules already laid down, that when you are driving, you keep left, you pass right when it is a dual carriage. But if it is a single lane kind of road, you only overtake when it is safe to do so. Everyone who follows these rules, the traffic is able to progress smoothly. Therefore, we, as we drive, we are submitting to one another, knowing that when this person shows this sign or gives this indication, it means the following. And therefore, we also give way and allow them to be able to do what they are supposed to do. And therefore, authority and submission are required to accomplish the purpose of the organization. When everyone does what they are supposed to do, it is the overall good of those under authority. And I think all of us, brethren, would like to function where there is order. But order only happens when we are submitted one to the other. Now, even in the Trinity, there is an eternal hierarchy of authority and submission. Although the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equally God, 
in every respect to carry out the divine plan for the ages, the Son submits to the Father and the Spirit submits to the Father and to the Son. The scriptures are very clear. Let me just illustrate that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 28. That is key, brethren, because we are Christians, therefore we must know that our God, within the Godhead, there is this hierarchy that must be submitted to. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 28. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Look also at John chapter 14 and verse 26. John 14 and verse 26. This is to help us to appreciate that being subject to one another implies no inferiority. A lot of times that's the thing we hate and that's the thing that causes us to apply blanketly to oppose uh, submission. 14 and verse 26, the book of John. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. This is interesting. The Father does a role, the Son performs another role, and the Holy Spirit is not thinking, why am I put below everyone else while I am equally God? And therefore there is unity in Trinity so that the Son, the Father, and everyone else, and the Holy Spirit does uh, have that kind of structure. Yet there is no rivalry or jealousy among the members of the Trinity, but rather perfect love and harmony. Especially chapter 6, beholding, uh, that is in the book by Bruce Ware, uh, where he says, beholding the wonder of the triune person in relation to community. As Ware points out, the most marked characteristic of the Trinitarian relationship is the presence of an eternal and inherent expression of authority and submission. I remember when I was doing my internship with the prisons department, it was a very interesting circumstance to the extent that on one of the days during the morning drill, the bosses know that some officers are promoted, but the officers don't know. So during drill, uh, they do whatever they are doing, and then the name of the officer is called to step forward. And then from some storage somewhere, they remove uh, badges to stick on them. You don't know how to celebrate because you are happy and yet you must uh, stick to the order that is stipulated. And immediately after being promoted, you are left now to take charge of the men who have otherwise been your colleagues. And because of that endowment, that bestowal of a medal of authority over you, immediately uh, everything changes. Now, a lot of us struggle with submission. A lot of us think, oh, I must submit because I am lesser. I must submit because I am less than, and so on. But it has nothing to do with that if we were to emulate the Trinity of our God. Secondly, God has ordained and instituted all authority. Besides that, there is a submission in Trinity. There is secondly, the fact that God has ordained and instituted all authority. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 states that every person is to be sub in subjection to the governing authorities. For those, 
For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Now in Luke chapter 4 verse 6, Satan tells Jesus that he had been given authority to hand over all the kingdoms of the world to whoever he wishes. And Jesus did not dispute that point. While sometimes we must resist evil government, authority in obedience to God is our responsibility. We need to recognize that he has ordained, that is, God has ordained for there to be authority. And therefore, to comply with authority is to comply with the law of God. I think this causes us a lot of times to struggle. We, we almost want to not even recognize that even this one could be God's servant serving above me. Thirdly, God has ordained authority for four reasons. Number one, God has ordained authority to accomplish his own purposes so that when we are required then to submit to one another, it is so that the work of God, the purposes of God can find the light of the day. As I explained, authority and accountability are necessary to accomplish any purpose through a group. We as a church are a group and God has a purpose for us. And that purpose is only possible under God's guidance through submission to authority. Whether it is to build a house or to run a company, an army, or a country. While in a fallen world, however, those in authority often abuse their position, it does not negate, however, that the necessity for proper authority comes from God. Therefore, those in authority also incur responsibility and accountability to God. To whom much is given then, brethren, much will be required. Luke chapter 12 and verse 48. The second uh, reason is God has ordained authority to protect and to bless those under authority. You know, I don't know what kind of example I can give, but sometimes you are glad or we should be glad that you are not the one in authority, especially when things have gone wrong. Because nobody is going to ask you to account, but the one who was in authority is the one who was given. Perhaps that's why even James says to us, we should not all be many teachers, because of the teachers, there will be a stricter judgment. Now, good human government protects and blesses the citizens who are under that government. But government exposes everyone to danger and corruption. As you know, if you traveled to a country that has a corrupt government, good family government protects and blesses the family. Good church government enables the members to grow and to thrive in the Lord. And therefore, when we are required then to submit to one another and to submit to our elders and to the leadership that may be established, we must know that it is because God has a purpose and that authority is meant to be a blessing. Now, thirdly, God has ordained authority to develop godly character in those who submit. Now, this is interesting. Children grow in or grow to maturity as they submit to their parents. As illustrated even with Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 51 and 52. Also, wives become holy and blameless as they submit to their husbands. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, and also verse 27. Church members, brethren, grow as they submit to their leaders. And therefore, you will be hearing us going forward. The elders desire this. 
the elders encourage this. And the normal, natural way will be then for all of us who are absolutely submitted to Scripture, then to submit to the authority that God has given us in our elders. This is very common in the Scriptures. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Look at it. It's basically not even a politically correct expression. And if we embrace it, if we internalize it, we will be better for it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 from verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have that as those who must give an account let them do this with joy and not with groaning because that would be of no advantage to you you can also look at first thessalonians first thessalonians First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. We ask you, brothers, that include sisters, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. That is interesting, isn't it? As Christian citizens, we grow in godliness as we submit to our government. In the submission, it's in that submission itself is a trait of God in Trinity. Even when an authority is unjust or ungodly, when we submit, we grow to be more like Jesus, who Jesus suffered unjustly for our sins. Now look at this because this is one of the key points in what I am uh, trying to deal with here. First Peter chapter 2. And we look at verse 18 to 23, an example of our master's submission. I know sometimes it seems right to raise an uproar, to raise your voice, to stand up for your rights, and to have your voice heard. But First Peter chapter 2, verse 18, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Now, Peter breaks it down for us so that none of us goes home without understanding. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God. One endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin, and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, listen to that, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Also, friends, submission is a very strong Impression. It's a very strong case 
which is given under the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. He submitted. And of course, many of us would want to stand up for our rights. We would want to not lead, uh, let a sleeping dog lie. Look at chapter 3 of 1 Peter, and again verse 12. For the eye of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, as you suffer, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, that's a concessive statement, almost contradicting. Do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also, that's another way of pulling Christ into the example, also suffered once for sin, the righteous, suffering for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which, that is the spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So this is Jesus submitting to unjust treatment. Now, do you want us to be a doormat? Do you want us to lay aside our own rights? It's not me. It's the scripture. You willingly, voluntarily submit. And then fourth purpose, God has ordained authority to help us to receive wisdom for life's decisions. Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. We must be careful. Uh, sorry. He often slipped away for prayer through that means what the father wanted or to know what mean what the father means for him to do mark chapter 1 verse 35 to 39 that's a very humbling uh, passage actually that he would go to pray as a way of submitting himself to the father so that as he prays then the father gives him further direction now, as we submit to God's word and seek the wisdom and counsel of those who are in authority over us, example, parents, church leaders, we can gain the wisdom for the important decisions in our lives. Now, to review, even Trinity, or even in the Trinity, there is eternal hierarchy. And... Uh, uh, eternal hierarchy of authority and submission. God has instituted all authority for four reasons. To accomplish his purposes, to protect and to bless those under authority, to develop godly character in those who submit, and fourthly, to help us receive wisdom for life's decision. And therefore, to assist God-given authority means, or oh, to resist, I apologize, to resist God-given authority means to thwart God's purposes and protection in our lives. I think even us, all of us as children of our own parents, 
The moment you decide you are an adult and therefore you do not need the wisdom of your parents, you will indeed left to your own ways. But then whoever resists authority removes himself from the protection and exposes himself to harm and punishment. Now this we see in Romans chapter 13 verse 2 and 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 15. Brethren, rebellion against God-given authority is a serious sin. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23. Satan fell because he wanted to put himself on an equal plane of authority with God. This way, the basis of his temptation to Eve to eat the fruit so that she would be like God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. He got her to resist, to oppose, to vary Adam's authority because the command not to eat the fruit came to Eve through Adam. That is Genesis chapter 2 verse 16, 17 and the first part of verse 18. Now, Satan's appeal was, you don't have to obey God or your husband. Make your own decisions. Make your own decisions. Be your own authority. That has been his appeal to all human, fallen human beings ever since. It is safe to say that all defiance against God-given authority originates from Satan and puts those who resist authority in opposition to God himself. Now, this is one of those things that causes me to fear. When, for one reason or another, any person decides they're going to oppose God, resist God, then they basically are placing themselves in opposition to God. Now, God has ordained authority in six areas, and please take note. I've already mentioned some of this, and I'm summarizing here. First, there is submission to God, who is sovereign of the universe, James chapter 4, verse 7. The fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord means that he is God, which is why we should fear him. Now, secondly, there is submission to government leaders. And thirdly, there is submission to church leaders. And then fourthly, there is submission of wives to husbands and of children to their parents. And fifthly, there is submission of workers to employers. And then finally, there is mutual submission in the body of Christ. Now, there are many ways this shows. I think those of you who know 1 Corinthians chapter 12 also know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, many are given, all are given a variety of giftings and the body, as is the illustration of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is made up of many parts that make up this one body. And these body parts work well in a non-confrontational way when there is internal submission within that kind of body. As I say, some strong expositors reject the last category. Submission to one another in the body of Christ. But there are also many that accept it. If there is a legitimate sense in which we are to submit to one another, brethren, it does not negate the other God-given areas of authority. Rather, it means that we are to set aside all self-seeking assertiveness and rather humbly serve one another in love. Brethren, the supreme example is our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who in the very context of washing the disciples' feet made it clear that he was still the Lord and teacher. He did not relinquish, set aside his authority when he submitted himself to serve them. Rather, he did not demand his rights or lead by dominating others. Besides Jesus, we also know of Paul. Paul had the right to be cared for by the churches, by the members that he was taking care of. But then he says in Acts chapter 18, we see him saying that he took on the trade of tent making so that he does not overburden, even though he had the right to be cared for them. We see also in Philippians chapter 2, and this is important, uh, verses 3 to 4, uh, where he says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Why should we submit in this way? Let me just examine the motive for submitting ourselves to one another. It is the fear of Christ. <laughs> That's a big motive. We are submitted to Christ naturally when we are Christians. When you say you are a Christian, you mean you have taken on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord. Now Paul says that we are to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now if you lack no other reason why then you should submit to one another, Submit, because the reason is given in the text, in fear of Christ. Now that means something, brethren. If you don't submit where Christ expects submission, you have issue with who? With Christ. And therefore, he will not let disobedience go unchecked. This is not the fear of like, a snake that you find in the bathroom and you've already closed the door and you don't know how to escape. But rather this is a reverential fear, acknowledging him for who he is that acknowledges Christ's supremacy as Lord of the universe and more particularly as the head of the church. It is the awe of knowing that God has put all things in subjection under Christ's feet. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22. So that at the name of Jesus, all things, uh, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11. And therefore, it is also the fear of grieving or disappointing the one who loved us, who gave himself for us. Now, our fallen human nature, my brethren, is not inclined towards submission. We have filled our minds and our hearts with uh, this word. I remember sometimes in Pig, one man was divorcing his wife, and we tried to inquire, what is the problem? Uh, the man kept saying, Hanatot. Hanatot. Break it down. What do you mean? You know, how is it? Break it down. What is she not doing? And therefore, brethren, it is possible that we can, being fallen human beings, nature, in a human nature, we are not inclined towards submission. Even as believers, we have a strong propensity to resist authority. Some, oh, so 
we must first and foremost bow before the Lord Jesus Christ when we fear him. Then we can more easily submit to the various spheres of human authority that he has ordained for our good. The test of whether we are truly submitted to God's ordained authority is whether we can submit joyfully. Now, gradual submission is perhaps better than no submission at all, but joyful submission shows that we are truly subject to God. Look at verse 21. It is a continuation of the result of being filled with the Spirit, which include joyful singing, joyful or hearty giving thanks. You can't, you can't divorce submission from the two preceding verses. Submission then can be joyful because we know that God has our good in view. And that submission is proper human or to proper human authority is ultimately submission to the Lord himself. And therefore, brethren, if you recognize him as your Lord, then you must recognize the authority that he places over you. Also, when those in authority live in the fear of Christ, they will not abuse their authority. They will exercise authority in love and out of desire to seek the highest good of those under their authority. They know that one day they will give an account to the judge of all. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. So, the view, this should view leadership not as an opportunity for personal advantage, but as a solemn responsibility to be exercised in the fear of Christ. When you are bossy, throwing your weight around, you have God to deal with. This is God's church, and he demands order in the fear of God. Conclusion. Let's ask a hard question, brethren. And this question will be answered in your hearts at personal level. Are you a submissive person? Most importantly, are you submitting daily to Jesus as Lord of everything in your life? Are you subject to the government in obedience to Christ? Are you submitting to the local church and its leadership? As a wife, brethren, are you submitting to your husband? More on this next week. Children, are you submit, are you subject to your parents? Workers, are you subject to your employer? And all of us, are you submitting yourself to one another in selfless service for Christ's sake? Do you look for needs and seek to minister to these needs? If you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, your relationships should be marked by joyful submission to one another out of the fear of God. Six hundred and seven.